So this is Mr. Steyer, Bruce right. Steyer, and he was a survivor of the Holocaust. He survived some of the some of the hardest things that people had to go through in the Holocaust. So listen very closely, and you'll hear very moving stories. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. First, let me say it's nice to see all your parents here. When the kids come home and they try to be able to tell you what they heard, it'd be strange to you, at least you know what they're talking about. So I want to welcome you all. The best way for evil to flourish is for good people to say nothing. During the 1930s and 1940s, the world stood idly by and allowed Hitler to flourish. That's why we had a Holocaust. Unfortunately, not much has changed. The Holocaust is something that cannot, should not, and must not be compared. Only those that were there in those camps can understand what went on. But I'll try to give you a little overview of what happened there, what went on. We know that six million Jews were slaughtered, not just killed. They did not die in peace, they died in pain. Or what are six million? If we were to take every man, woman, and child in the state of Maryland, we would not come up with six million. We would have to include the state of Delaware. But those are numbers. What I'll be speaking about is people. Parents, children, brothers and sisters, grandparents, people like you and I. And I keep on asking the same question over and over again. Why did the world allow this to happen? Why is the world allowing it to happen right now as we speak? I can't find the answer. I, when the war broke out on September the 1st, 1939, I was 15 years old. Almost as old as the probably that you are. My world changed completely. My childhood disappeared, education, all the things that you guys are doing, I did not have. It just ended. So I had to grow up. I had to become a man overnight. It was Friday, September the 1st, 1939. My parents said, there's a war going on, we must leave our own. Because we didn't have any more transportation, we took a few of the things that we could carry. And we left our home. We marched all day, and as you probably know in Jewish religion, Friday at sunset, the Sabbath begins. We stopped on a field, we had a little food with us, we set up players, and we slept out all night. Next morning, we were ready to continue, and the Germans called up to us. And on the fifth day, we were liberated, we can go back home. We turned around and marched towards our home. Before we reached our town, everyone was stopped. Jews and Christians alike. We immediately separated the Jews from the Christians. While the Christians were allowed to go home, we were detained until Sunday every afternoon. Then we too were thought we could go home. Outside of the village, the road divided. Those that went to the right, which my family were among them, came home safely. Those that went to the left, 272 men, women, and children were killed. Their crime they committed, they were born of the Jewish faith. Monday morning, the Holocaust really began. We had one synagogue in town. We were told to come to the synagogue. They made us carry out the prayer books and the Torah, which the Bible is written in it. And they poured gasoline and they burned them. I assume they made a fire to scare us, to frighten us, to dehumanize us. And they pretty well succeeded. We were also told that from now on we were to come to the town square every single morning, read the new laws specifically designed for Jews, but we did not have any newspapers, we had, so we had to go 
corner where they posted the all the new laws on the square. Okay. Not for what we can do, but what we cannot do. For example, if I walked on the sidewalk and a German approached me, I had to go on the gutter. I wasn't worried walking even on the same ground, the same nerves as they did. And so many more. I do not have specific dates, but I do remember the seasons. Some of the things, no matter how long I'm going to live, I'm going to remember it as it would have yesterday. Things like this you cannot forget. <coughs> My life had changed completely from then on. As I said, I do not remember the, season, the, the dates, but I do remember the seasons. In the spring of 1940, we were taught to leave our homes and move into an area called the ghetto. Now we hear the word ghetto being used a lot here, quite often. In this country we have a certain ethnic group, color, religion, nationality, or whatever, living in one area, it's called the ghetto. But you can come, you can go as you please, you can stay there, you can leave. Not the ghetto that I'm going to be describing to you. They chose the biggest slum area that they could find, and there were many of them in Europe, as there are here. And they told us to move in and they assigned each family so we living quarters. I come a family of eight. We were given one room, probably not bigger than the room you have at home. How do eight people live in one room? Again, because we didn't have any mode of transportation, we had to, we took a few of the things that we could carry. No furniture. We had a little bedding, a little clothes, the food we had, that was the bed necessities, and moved into that area, as you can see it in the first picture. My mother, in, in that room we had one bed. My mother managed to step in it. The rest of us had to bed down over a stable. There wasn't any room we had to lie down. Summertime, the nights are not the sharp and humid that are here, it's better. But in the winter time it gets very, very cold. We, I have, I've been here a long time and I've never had a night that was as cold as over there. It's usually below zero. But we didn't have enough bedding, we literally wore our clothes 24 hours a day just to keep warm. That was not a problem where we're going to sleep. I'm sure most of us see it, I know I could. I'm tired enough, I can lie down on this floor, stretch out my arms, put my head on it, and fall asleep. There were many more bigger problems than that. In a slum area as it is here, there's no industry. There are no factories, no business. There are no business, and no factories, and no jobs. We had to find a way how to get a little food in the house. I had to grow up. I had to be a man. My younger brother, older brother, and I, we became the so-called sole breadwinners. Summertime we would smuggle out of the ghetto, crawling on our arms and legs and our bellies, not to be, not to be, so no one could notice us, and to our feet where the farmers planted something and dug up with our hands and brought it home. Once we got it home, my mother had to rest me. If the weather was bad, it was raining, we could not crawl on our arms and legs and bellies. That meant nothing was coming again. But that's in the summertime. What about the other three seasons? Fall, winter, and spring when nothing is growing. We had to find again a way how to get a little food, how to get a little money. We knew that the Poles, most Poles, were very, very anti Semitic. I learned that practically the day I was born. I remember I must have been two, three at the most. A pastor was sitting in my father's lap and somebody threw a rock through the window. Each and every Jewish home had shutters. Once the sun went down, we closed the shutters. There used to be a sport with the kids to walk around and throw rocks through the windows. 
I went to school, I didn't have to sit with everybody else. I had to sit in the back because I was Jewish. We did not have any indoor plumbing like we have here. We had art houses. Once I got in that classroom, I would not leave because our playgrounds were not paved like they were here. They were made out of dirt and stones. I would go out, they would sit there and throw sand in our faces. Never walked to school or left school walking, always ran. And there were so many other things. But we had to take chances. What we did the other seasons, we smuggled out of the ghetto at night into a Christian home, knocked on the door hoping that they would open up and try to sell anything of value to get a little money so we can cash in the coupons that they gave us, the coupons that they gave us on food. But even there was a problem. The snow starts coming down in November, it does not leave it until sometimes in March. As we know, if we walk in snow, we leave footprints. All the Germans had to do is to see where we came from, where we went, that that would be suicidal. We literally prayed for a prison. Snow would come down, the wind would blow and cover up the footprints. The purpose of the ghetto was to have all Jews concentrated in one small area. But they were ready to take us away for extermination. They were the main goal, their only goal. They had us in one small area. And you see here, the second poster. All they had to do is come there and it's like fishing a pond throw in the net and put us out. April the 12th, 1942 is one day that I would remember. I was 16 years old. <coughs> My parents felt when they come and they're going to try to get, they're not going to take me as a child. Little did they know then what was about to happen. My father, older brother and older sister went to hiding. I still don't know where they hid, but it didn't matter. Middle of the night, we heard the truck pulling up. The Germans were always very loud in their boots and trucks. My mother immediately went to the door. Knowing she doesn't open it up when they're dead and when they break it. And we had no way of replacing it. No sooner did she get it, there was a knock on the door. She opened it up. They came in like a tank. They knocked it down. She picked herself up and they yelled out the names of my father and older brother, where are they? My mother said, I don't know. She probably didn't. She didn't hear to tell me. Kept on screaming, repeating the same question, they got the same answer. They looked at me and told me to stand up. I stood up. They came over and grabbed me by my arm. My mother is all of your mothers and your mother. Anybody else? But she and I were no match for them. Started pulling me out, and my mother started pulling me. By, they grabbed me by my arm and started pulling me out. My mother grabbed me by the others, but she and I were no match. I was taken away from me never to see, or for that matter, knowing what happened to my parents. As you can see it here and the three younger siblings. I do not remember what my, what the Germans looked like, I did not look at them. But never will I forget the expression, the faces of my mother and my three younger siblings that stayed at home. Keep on wondering what did, when my father came home and my two older siblings came home, when they were told what happened, how did they feel, and what did they look like. I never know that either. I was taken away to a camp when I got there. They took several things from me. They took my family. They took my freedom. They took my name. And they gave us, and they, we had to get undressed. Leave everything behind us. Stood there naked. 
And they gave us, each one of us, a new outfit consisting of a pair of pants and a jacket. I sat down there with top and bottom short together, a pair of shoes, no socks, a blanket to serve as a sheet in the cover, and a burlap bed to fill up with straw that became our mattress. Then we were assigned to a barrack. I speak of a barrack, I'm not speaking the kind of barracks we have here. These were huts, if you ever go to the museum, you see pictures of them. Made out of boards, and four walls, a roof and a floor. One end a window, on the other end of a door. And we had fountains. Two long tables, with benches on each side, and two buckets for human waste. At night there was curfew, we were not allowed to go out. Every morning we took turns and emptied it. I filled up that straw and I put it up on my bunk and I climbed up on it and I lay down, put my face into the straw. I did all night crying. I'd never been away from home. I didn't know what it was like being away from my family. I kept on thinking what would happen to me. What do I need advice? Who am I going to ask? Would I ever get out and all the things that each one of us here would think of? But the next morning, the Germans made sure we didn't have time to cry. I did not have time to cry. They kept us pretty busy. It became a routine for quite a while. They woke us up at 6 o'clock. 6.30, they gave us our rest for the day. They had to rest all day. A cup or substitute coffee. No bread, no cereal, no nothing. Seven o'clock, we had to be ready, lined up in the rooms of five, and marched for a whole hour to work. First day we got to work, they gave each one of us a shovel. They told us if we do the shovel, we'd have to dig dirt with our hands. The kind of work we did, we literally moved mountains into valleys, we leveled the grounds, so we could build a munition factory. We worked from 8 to 12, no matter what the weather was, there were no snow days or rain days or any kind of days. It was work every day. We worked from 8 to 12 non-stop, no matter what the weather was. 12 to 12 30, we had so-called rest periods. The weather was nice, we just, uh, we just lie down on the dirt, stretch out my arms, and either for, take a quick nap or rest a little bit. We had to conserve every bit of energy we could. Then we worked from 12 to 30 to 6 o'clock non-stop. 6 o'clock, we were counted and marched back to camp for a whole hour. Can you imagine we had to be outside on a hot summer day, the temperatures 90, 95, 100 degrees. Sun beating down on you, you don't even have a drop of water. What that would feel like. By the winter time, your parents wouldn't allow you to leave home without, we did not have. We did not have any heavy coats, gloves, scarves, hats, decent shoes, all the things that your parents make sure that you wear. We're out there on a very cold day, below freezing. Snow coming down, blizzards, rain, whatever, and don't even have a hot cup of coffee. We had no one to complain. Got back to camp at 7 o'clock, around 7 o'clock. In the middle of the camp there was one barrack that housed uh, about a dozen showers on one side, and boards cut out with holes that we used for toilets. There was no privacy or anything. We had a half an hour time to use both facilities. We were about 1,200 men to or take some, depending on how many died. Half an hour is 1,800 seconds. We were on 1,200 men. Divide 1,200 into 1,800, you have one and a half seconds to use these facilities. It takes longer than that to get in. First few men that got in had a little hot water in there, it's cold water. The summertime, any kind of water was very refreshing. What about in the winter time, or even there like today? Even if I had the opportunity to get in and get a little hot water, I would not do it. Because the things that we all take so much for granted, we did not have. 
We did not have any cow to dry ourselves up. We did not have any toilet paper, tissues, toothpaste, all the things that we found in our bedroom. Well, that meant we walked around for weeks and months without putting a drop of water in our bodies. If you don't pay lights for them, they're very infectious. Usually typhoids and that that killer had the general skill of birthday. I was liberated, it took me seven months before I could see my original color of the skin, my skin. I had three years worth of dirt in the camps and two years worth of dirt together. Seven thirty they gave us our lesson for the day. I'm sure you had studied in school and you heard your parents say you got to eat certain kind of foods. Got to have your fruits, your vegetables, your meats, and your milk, and all the things as we know it. And the whole time that I was in the campus, for three years and three days, to be exactly, I never saw most of these things, not only. They gave us a small portion of bread and a cup of soup made out of the baker that would feed the cattle. That had to last 24 hours. That was our meal every day. How any one of us survived, it's got to be the greatest miracle, at least in my opinion. In 1943, again, spring 43, we were transferred from one camp to the other. The difference was in the first camp we had the Wehrmacht, the military. These were middle-aged men, they weren't able to fight in the war on the war front. They weren't so bad. By not being bad, they left us at dawn and we were happy. We thought of them as angels. Then we went to a camp where we had to be a different kind of guards. These were Hitler's elite, the SS. I am not going to describe to you a lot of things, what they did to us, the graphic. Different was between the first ones and the second ones. Second ones, the punishments were so much more severe. Two most often used punishments were had to take a chair, pick them up by the front legs, and you guys may want to try because these are very light chairs. Ours were much heavier. Had to pick them up by the front legs because the rear legs and the back has more weight and puts you down. Stand on your toes, but don't put your heels down and see how long you're going to last. And you fellow guys, probably much stronger than we were. They used to sit there with the sun down, and if by accident I fell back and my heels touched the ground, they would turn it over and start it over again. The other one was specially designed desk. They used a whip very effectively. Sometimes 25, sometimes 50 lashes, or it depends on what crime I committed. And they could put me out for anything that they cared, that they felt like. Sometimes they gave us 25, sometimes 50. Sometimes they allowed us to keep our pants up, other times we had to put them down. And when we had to put our pants down, they literally cut through the flesh. When they finished with us, all we could do is clean ourselves up wipe off the blood, but make sure that we go to work the next day. There were no sick days. Anybody that couldn't go to work would be sent away, never to be seen or heard from again. As the war was coming to an end, end of 1944, we never had a calendar or even a date or a time. We were told we were going to evacuate the camp. We did not have any personal belongings except that literally that lovely blanket. But we had to learn how to help us a little bit survive. We didn't have an aspirin, we didn't have a band-aid, we had nothing. But I had learned that you take paper, put them between your clothes, you keep the wind out, therefore it keep your body temperature in. I took a cement paper bag and I put them between my clothes and I was ready to go. The Orchard gave us a new pair of shoes with wooden soles. Maybe some of you ladies wore wooden soles. You walk in snow. 
and wooden soles, the snow sticks to it. Don't kick it off. You can twist an ankle or break a leg. We marked on dirt the roads and covered with snow on dirt. They weren't plowed. And if you didn't kick it off, as I said, you could break a leg. And if you don't kick off the snow, you get taller and taller. Many of us were weaker than others, and those that, when they kicked it off, the weak ones fell down. Once they fell down, many of them couldn't, have, very strong enough to get up. They were shooting, and we had a truck firing us and picking up bodies like a pickup fish in highway. We marched all day, at the end of the day, it was getting dark, they told us we could stop. The problem was, over our head we had the sky, under our feet we had snow and dirt. I knew if I went to sit down in the winter time, the snow was going to melt and I went to be out there in my clothes. You try to hold out, but after a while you do what you have to. We marched for three days, slept outside for three nights. After three days, they finally marched us over to a railroad track and a train pulled up. As you can see right here, they opened up the gates. They pushed in about a hundred or so, as many as they could. They gave each one of us a loaf of bread about the size of a brick and they gave us a famous bucket for human waste. And they closed the gate. Had it been the summertime, we, would, we probably would have suffocated. Fortunately, it was the winter time, and the prayer seemed true. We go to the museum in Washington, you see, with one of those cars. They were very nice and neat. But anyone that was in there would tell you there was hell on earth. It's beyond description, and I'm not even going to attempt to. There wasn't any room to sit down. After a while, the little room became available. But when I looked down that floor, as dirty and filthy as I felt, I could not get myself to sit down. You can only imagine the pocket over and spread out over the floor. But again, after a while, you do what you have to. You don't get used to it. You just suffer with it. The best way I can describe the conditions of car. After three nights, three days and three nights, and they finally opened up the gate to let us out. Out of a hundred or so that they pushed in, ten of us walked out alive. We were taken by truck to a camp called Bergen Basin. Bergen Basin are like Auschwitz, the Brink and others did not have any gas chambers. Did not have any territories. They didn't need any. All they had to do was put us there and nature would take care of us. When I got there, I was hoping at least there's going to be a little straw I can lie down and rest. Instead, they put us into an empty shed. The floors were wet, there were holes in the roof. I guess the snow melted and dripped down. I sat down between each other's legs to keep the wind out. And like a domino effect, we fell back and fell asleep. The next morning it became a routine for the remainder of my carcery. They woke us up between 4 and 4 30. We had to go outside, no matter what the weather was, in this winter time. And line up the rows of five, wait for them to come around and be counted. Bring out all the dead bodies that died overnight, tie them up in five, and wait for them to come around and um, between two and two thirty at the counters. They turned off the water. They, they, they turned off the water, but they turned it on between ten and ten thirty. But we were not allowed to get out of the line. That meant we had nothing to drink. I was literally hoping for a little rain or snow. If it would rain, I would just put the palms of my hands out and catch a few drops of rain. I had a little fluid in my body. If it snowed, I would take it off my clothes or even get down to the ground. I would pick it up with some dirt. 
As we were counted, we got our ration and had the rest the whole day. I mentioned before they were giving us a small portion of bread and a little bit of soup. They took the bread away. I assumed they needed to speed up the dying. And the whole time that I was in Berlin Basin, that's all I ever had is a, small, a, a cup of soup. Again, how I survived, I don't know. As we finished our meal, we had a job to do. The job was the camp was literally littered with dead bodies. As you can see it right here. We walked over by over bodies. Our job was to remove it. What we did, we tied them on with our arms and legs with belts. There were thousands of belts. Red them in the mud and the snow on the ground onto a huge graves, as you can see in the next poster. We threw them in, broken, everything just threw them in. We would not stop until everybody was, everyone was removed. After we finished our job, we just stood around outside. And then again, no matter what the weather was, it was better than inside. They brought in friends from every single day, both men and women. We were placed in. One day a group of women would come again and I just stood around. I still don't know what I did, probably daydreaming or whatever. And I heard somebody yelling out my name, Ruben. I turned around and I saw a familiar face. Face I had not seen for three years. My older sister. She had to keep on moving. I could not go out to her because I was placed in. Oh, now I knew that she was there, but I did not know if she did or if she died. These huge holes were near the women's section. Every time I saw a woman lying face down, I would turn her over, hoping I won't recognize her. Fortunately, I did not. Finally, the day of the so-called liberation came. I say so-called liberation is now, what, 60-some years, and I'm still here. What about all of those that were finally liberated and kept from dying? Out in the other graves. It was an unstop. Among those that died just before liberation is a young lady, you might have read a book. Her name is Anne Frank, in Berlin West. Keep on wondering what would have Anne Frank have accomplished, what would she have achieved? How much would she have contributed if she had been around today? We would never know. How many her friends were there? Among them, there's some right here that I personally know. And why? When I was liberated, I was as close to dying as anybody could be. So some men walked into a warehouse and I figured there must be something I might want. I could not walk, I dragged myself over with my last bit of energy in my body. And I saw bread. I cannot describe to you what that bread looked like to me. The biggest lottery could not make me as happy. I pulled over four small loaves of bread. Somebody saw me having them. He took two away from me and I wasn't strong enough to fight him. I put two in my coat and I went into a coma. For the next few days, five, six days, I was out. I still don't know what happened. When people found each other in the camps, they walked through the living and the dead to see whether they were looking at the face that they could notify a loved one. A girl found me. She went, she notified my sister. My sister was sick too. She had typhoids and who knows what else. But she was the stronger of the two. She, and she, my sister does not talk about it. My older brother survived too. But she gave me bits and pieces. A few years ago, she gave me some more, a little more information. 
I went to speak to a class at Warren Park, and I said to her, she came down to visit me, she lived in Europe, and I said, I'm going to speak to school, why don't you come with me and listen to me? She said, you know I don't talk about it, I said, I do, I'm not asking you. What I want you to do is come and listen, maybe you can add some track or something. And she did. When I got there after I finished my speech, my first question was, what was it like after liberation? I turned to her and I said, Kelsey, you know, I don't know, I was out, you were there, why didn't you tell him? And she agreed. When she came there, I was still in a coma. She found me, she found me naked. She went, she took off her underwear and put it on me. Give me back some decency, some humanity. I truly feel if my sister would not have been there, that I would not be standing here. My mother gave birth to me 19 years before her. My sister gave life back to me at that time. She did everything she could and then some to save me. She knew if she does not do it, I will be gone. A few months ago, I was talking to her and she told me that we were talking about it after liberation. And she told me that her friend told her, God said, let him go. She would not give up. She knew she has to keep on doing it. If she had not been there, I would not be here. For the next seven months, I was a vegetable. I was so skinny. If you look at this man here, this is not me, but you could see me when I put my face on that. And uh, I was so skinny that when I, if you don't have any flesh, on your body and you lie in the same place, your skin just comes off. I had no skin on my back at the line after this. seven months I had to be treated like a vegetable. What happened they gave us a can of bacon, a can of sweet condensed milk, like putting gasoline on fire. They gave us diarrhea, dysentery, and Everything just flashed through her bodies. I could not gain an ounce at all. And after seven months, finally started gaining an ounce at the time. It took me three years to get out, so called get out of the woods. The Holocaust teaches us an awful lot. When I look at you, I remember when I was your age. And I keep on asking myself, what is it like being after your age? I don't know, I haven't been there. And I keep on thinking how lucky, how fortunate all of you are here. You're going to your family, first of all, your parents, some of them are here now. You're going to a great school, you have a home, you have siblings. You have so much to look forward to, and you're so lucky to have all these things. Something that I never had. It's going to be up to you in the future to become whatever you want to be. If you don't make it, you can only blame yourself. I wish I had 1% of the opportunities. It's what you're going to make of yourself. I know you can make it. And the reason why I'm so confident of it is when I came, I'm going to tell you a little bit what happened to me coming here, and then you compare yourself to what you have and how lucky you are. When I came here, I had no family, I had no money, I didn't speak English, I didn't have an education, I had no place to live, I had no job, no experience, and I had to start in a new country. And I made it. I came here, I came with a friend of mine, we rented a, a room, and the room we had one bed, we slept in one bed for over a year because that's all we could afford. 
what we did have, we did have a home. He could have come visit me, he could have heard to me. We had a one bed and we had a table and two chairs and ice box. We bought a pack of ice every single day, 50 cents. We had a hot plate. The little floor to jump in the floor. Then we started looking for a job. Everywhere I went, they were turned down. I couldn't communicate with anyone. I couldn't understand them and they couldn't understand me. Finally, after seven weeks, I finally, I finally found somebody that was willing to hire me. The offer was he wanted to pay me $23 a week, which is less than 60 cents an hour, and work 40 hours a week. I said to my social worker, why would I take 60 cents an hour when I'm getting $37 a week from work or get so used to it that should, that should exist if you want to live that way. I am not against anybody wanting to live that way. I keep on wondering why people would want to be on welfare for the rest of their lives. The first day I got, I, so I took the job. First day I did clean the bedroom and swept the floor. But it was up to me to get where I am today. Today I can proudly say I'm retired, comfortably retired. Never owned a business, never inherited a bank. Never got any wager except for the first seven weeks. I have been married now 61 years and been this week. Same moment. We have three children. They're all educated. High, you know, went to higher education. We have seven grandchildren. They have finished school already. Because in this country, if I could make it, think what you can do. If you ever fail, remember what I said. It's your fault, no one else's. But we have something in this country that's even more important than that. Something that so many, everyone, practically everyone takes it for granted. Something that's called freedom. You're free to do whatever you want. You have the ability to become anything you want to be. Because I made it, think what you can do. Freedom is something that we must protect with everything we've got. But once we lose it, it's so very, very hard to get back. Thank you all very, very much. Now, now it's going to be your turn. Ask any questions you want, the mothers included, the fathers included. I'd like to answer it, but I can't. Okay, oh, we've got plenty of hands, but you have to speak louder. I can't really. Okay, sorry. Can you give me the Nazis? We have to give the Nazis, girl. However, I do not go around and say that I hate every German. Because most of the Germans weren't being born. It's wrong to blame the people because somebody did something wrong. I never forgive the Nazis. But I cannot go down and hate the Germans or the Poles for that matter. Both of them were involved. Because if I would go down and hate them, only I would be the one that suffers. They don't know I hate them. Both of them are dead already. So why would I go down and punish myself? And I think if you if you learn to dislike me and I don't know. You're going to hate me and I don't know, only you going to suffer, not I, because I don't even know. So it's wrong to go around and hate somebody without the other person knowing anything about it. Okay? Okay. Um, what was the longest period of time you went without having food? You what? The longest period of time you went without having food? What was the longest period of time you went without having any food, anything to eat? Uh, well, you can say uh, the little food I got. You can say this, 
it was no food, a piece of uh, a cup of soup for several months. It's going a long time without food. For even the three years I was in the camp, a piece, small piece of bread and a little bit of soup, you want to call that food? People died from hunger, many of them, millions probably. Okay. James? Um, do you know, like, anywhere, do you have, like, do you know where these places were? Like, do you know where the camps were? I know you've gone back I know to where visit. the camps were, are, are, where, they're, where they are. The camps are still intact. What they did is they burned down the, the, uh, the, the, the bunks, the, the barracks. They burned them down because they were so infected. <laughs> But there are a lot of things that still standing there. I went back to some of them. Um, where are you originally from? Where are you originally from? Where is your country of origin? Oh, I was born in Poland. Georgia. Um, what was it like being away from your parents and uh, your I have hearing aids, but they're yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. I'll, I'll be the, the second voice. Um, what was it like being away from your parents? Being taken from your parents. I cannot describe it to you, you can only imagine. Think if you were away from your parents, what would it feel like? I hope you never have to. But think what would it feel like? It is the worst thing that can happen. A child being taken away from your parents or or don't worry about it, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's it's really you start thinking about yeah, it, it's very it's sad. I try to do it another time. Nothing on this time. Um, I know uh, you know that you knew that your oldest was sister. Was a, was a very good question. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you knew that your oldest sister was alive. Um, did you know uh, um, after the liberation, um, if any of your other siblings or parents were alive? Your, your other family members that survived, you want to know about them. So your sister and your uh, older brother. My older sister and older brother. My sister lives in New York, and my brother is in Florida. And these are my parents. My father was 42. Last time I saw my mother was 40. So this girl here on the left, she's my younger sister. She was 10. Then my brother in the middle, he was 14. And my other sister was 12. It was, uh, she was 10. My other sister was 12. And you don't know that they, sur they didn't survive? I not only don't, I know they survived. I give anything, think that people, that most people take for granted. I give my right arm and right leg to have, that I can go to a grave and stay there and tell them how much I miss them, <coughs> how I wish they would, they would be. I give my life for them to be in my house <coughs> today for one night sleep in a bed, as I do right now on a, on a regular mattress, I have a sofa to sit down, for my mother to have a washing machine and dry in, so I have it all order, and all the things that we have in our home. They never knew anything about that. These five people never slept in a regular mattress. But we have to live here. I keep on asking myself, I keep on asking my parents what should I do when I give myself the answers. They want me to go along and do the best I can and live a normal life as I can. And that's what I've been doing. I've been listening to them and giving myself the answers. I think Mr. Starr's parents would be very proud of them. What do you think? Um, do you remember what your home was like before the war? Yes, I do remember what the home was like. Our family, family made in the good days. We had two rooms. We had two rooms and we were eight people. Each room had two beds. I never slept myself in a bed. We had always slept with my father. We doubled up. And uh, our refrigerator was a hole cut in the floor and cut up some dirt. 
and that was the effort, effort cooling and healing. In the winter time it was warm under the day, and in the summer time it was cool. That was our refrigeration. And as far as the heating, we used to chop wood, we used coal, and uh, so many other things that we never think of. You think of what you have compared, and I only told you this much. Did you see the gas chambers? What? He was asking about the gas chambers in the concentration camps. Gas chamber? I never was in a camp where they had to get a gas chamber. However, I did go back to Auschwitz because each and every one of us, matter of fact, everyone here is Jewish, kept somebody dying there. But they all came over here, the ancestors came over here. So I went back there to Auschwitz. That is our so called our cemetery. I don't know whether any, any members of my family were there, not just my parents or my siblings, uncles, grandparents, aunts, <coughs> cousins, and all, all kind of relatives. William? Uh, did you hear anything about the he wanted to know what it was like to see someone die. What's it like? You have a question? Mm -hmm. In the beginning, it's terrible. But after a while, you have to get used to it. If not, if you ask me how did I survive, I can give you two reasons. None of this, but two. I'm not sure that's what it is, but I can give you two reasons. Never to give up. No matter how bad it is, somebody has it worse. If you can't do a paper, don't ever give up because you can do it. It might be harder for you to do it than somewhere else, but you can make it. And you can't have luck. Without luck, you're not going to get nowhere. Those are the only two reasons that I can give. My survival. Never wanted to die. I've seen people, two men, particularly two men, dying overnight. They gave up one died just a day before liberation. A friend of mine from my town, and he said to me, Ruben, I'm not going to make it, and he didn't. Another one from now was the hospital, they used to send home different nationalities, and they took the smaller numbers first. They sent the Italians home first. There was an Italian lying in next, next to me in bed, and they told him he cannot go home because he's too sick. He took it so seriously, and the next day, there was a sheet over him. He died. So, no matter what it is, don't ever, ever give up. You can do more for yourself than the doctor can. But you got to want to do it. Do two more, Mana. When did you to America? Oh, how did you get a job if you couldn't speak the language? How did you get your job uh, with, with no language? How did you get the job here? To clean the bathroom and sweep the floor if you don't have to know the language. No, I like how you ask me for a job. How did you even go about asking? Did you have people here well, helping? Did not ask me. Uh, oh, this man, with the job I got, he spoke my language. Yes. So that I came up with that. What are the bones on the picture right here? Which picture is that? This here? No, the other one. Those are, yeah, that's how, this is his leg right here. He, he, he must be in a coma, or he's so sick he can move, as I was. So, skin and bone, there's no flesh on it. Well, he's given you lots to think about, hasn't he? Okay. Um, and I know you're going to go home, and if your parents are here, or even if they are here, you'll have lots to talk about at home. It's important to keep the story going. I know that's what Mr. Sarah wants you to do. That's your job now, is to think about how you can live your life, but also to tell the story. Don't let anyone ever forget. 
So thank you very much. Since you didn't ask any questions, if you want to ask me after they leave, be feel free. Yeah, we'll send the boys back to their class and again, the parents are on. Mm -hmm. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.